Now. Good morning. Our time in this room is limited, and um, but I am not rushed. And if you want to chat about the lesson or other burning theological questions, we can do so out in the hall. But we have a responsibility to clear this room um, around 10:30 or 10:35. So this will be a speed session. But I did give a, a worksheet for you, um, which if you haven't done it, you can do it later, and hopefully that will make up for the time that we were not together. Um, we're on week six, if I haven't lost my mind. Y'all give me a nod. Okay. And, um, and what we're doing is we're really unpacking the, um, the equation of perseverance um, that the Bible presents to us. And we're taking each of these elements, uh, like faith, and hope and um, adversity, and we are understanding them independently and trying to understand them as they relate to perseverance. And so today we take up the role of faith in perseverance. Okay? And um, again, just to review where we have been together, um, we learned maybe in week two or three that being devoted to prayer is an attribute of perseverance. That concept of devotion to prayer was one of those three-pronged um, directives from um, that Bible passage that we were looking at. Rejoicing in our future hope allows us to triumph over our tribulations. I think that was last week when we talked about uh, without hope, we don't go on. And we have hope that keeps us going, but we also have the future hope, um, the glory of God uh, revealed. And we can see the glory of God revealed in the here and now, uh, but there's a much more full glory uh, beyond that. Facing tribulation, trial, and temptation is part of being human. Um, it's not put upon us as a test. Or, it, or given to us to strengthen us, we can be strengthened if we pick up that weight and start pumping iron with our trials and tribulations. Uh, but it's not my theology, and I don't want to suggest to you that God puts these trials or tribulations on you. Um, in the face of present difficulties, and, and I named a few here, we can persevere because we have hope in who God is, in God's character. God is trustworthy, God is true, and our hope is not misplaced because we have the character of God and God's promises. Um, only with a secure hope rooted in the faithfulness of God, and by that I mean God is faithful, God delivers, God keeps promises, will we be able to weather the storms of life. Honestly, I know that you all have people in your lives who have gone through tragedies or things, and, and you, or, or maybe you have, and you look at someone and go, I don't know how I would have done it if, if not for God. Or you look at somebody and go, I don't know how I'm going to get through this without God. And that's when I start praying, you know, whatever their beliefs are, I just pray the presence of God around them because um, it, we cannot weather these storms on our own. Part of per per Christian perseverance is keeping our eye on the prize. Scripture tells us the prize is Jesus, and um, it's our total confidence that Christ will complete the work that he began in us that enables us to persevere over a lifetime. Now, yeah, I read that statement and I say, hmm, I wonder how many people in the room or anywhere believe that right now. And you may not. You, that just may be a, a whole big thing for you to swallow. Um, but it's the kind of thing where uh, I think it was John Wesley, the father of Methodism, who said, preach faith until you have it. Okay. Um, this is, if we put this on our refrigerator and reminded ourselves every day that it's our confidence that Christ will complete the work he began in us that enables us to persevere, then maybe we can live into that, um, even if it's hard to, to, to swallow whole um, sitting in a classroom or content, uh, pondering it. But the bottom line from last week is without hope, people give up. And so today we look at the role of faith and perseverance. And um, I've made two observations at the top of my page, too. And it's 1 
first is the Christian life must not only be sustained by hope, but also empowered by faith. So think about hope as, uh, I think we talked about it as the anchor. <laughs> the hope is uh, grounding us. Um, but we also need some wind beneath our wings. We need some power. And so faith provides that motor or that power. And, um, and we looked at those four dudes from the Old Testament, and we saw the choices that they made to persevere. And one of the um, common choices that they made, and one of the most overt to us choices that they made, was to remain faithful to God. We could have looked at Job and said the same thing. Job made some choices, and one of his choices was not to give up on God, even when his friends and his wife and, you know, the circumstances, um, you know, he, he ultimately thought, you know, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm not giving up on God. And he did want his moment with God, which he did have. But um, So what can we say about choosing to remain faithful? And for that, I went to Growing in Grace uh, by Bob George, and um, I found just a couple of points to summarize for you. Living by faith is a life of total dependency. Now, that might be the hardest biblical thing that a Christian ever says to another Christian. And I'm going to tell you how I know that. My father had, as you know, Lou Gehrig's disease. By the time he died, he literally could not move a muscle. And it, the muscles go in different orders, and people go sooner or later. Um, what kills you is when your diaphragm muscle, uh, you, you have no control over that. But um, before he lost control of his diaphragm, he lost control of his feet and his legs and his hands and his arms and his trunk. You know, the, the, these trunk muscles. And um, he had total dependence. He could not scratch his eyebrow. Um, the only way he could communicate is if a caregiver took his hand and put it on a mouse in a particular way, a computer mouse. And we had diagrams and we had the same staff trained and he had ways of giving feedback, <laughs> like blinking his eyes, whether they got it or not. But I'm telling you, I witnessed total dependence. He was miserable. A life of total dependence is everything you think it might be. And we all fear it, right? It is degrading. It is um, just unbearable. And yet, I'm standing up here telling you with regards to faith that... Um, Living by faith is a life of total dependency. And, and, and the opposite of that might be the push me, pull you, we play with God. God, I'm turning over my children to you. Please help them be strong and make good choices. And then you know, take them back. <laughs> you know? And then you turn over uh, a situation and then you take it back. It's a push me and a pull you. Um, but we have to look that kind of total dependence in the eye and say, with respect to God, he will catch me in that trust fall. Um, and if I can't move a muscle, he will move my life the way it's supposed to move. Um, the second point that I gleaned for you all is we need to have a sense of objectivity, uh, that God or Christ are both trustworthy as the object of our faith, and that God and Christ are available. In other words, Subjective experience is, uh, if I hug you and I tell you that you're a good hugger, I have subjectively experienced you and your hugging, and I give my opinion, okay? Um, you may or may not have subjectively experienced um, the trustworthiness of God, or that um, God is available. Uh, but, but we have to uh, have a sense of objectivity I mean, I haven't touched the sun either, and I've not even seen it in a telescope, and you're not even really supposed to look at it, right? But I have a sense of objectivity. The sun is there. I could be wrong, but as part of my objective view of the world, I know that the sun is there. And 
that's the kind of objectivity we are called on to have about uh, the presence um, and the availability of God. Um, I think those are hard. Don't think just because they're, you know, quick little bullet points on a piece of paper, that makes them any easier. And so total dependency means we rely on the written word and we trust God for the ability to do what God wills and we entrust God with the results of our actions. Um, you know, you can say to God, I'm going to do this. I'm not sure if it's the right thing or not, but for whatever reason, um, I, I, I feel you nudging me to do this. And I don't know if it's going to be successful or not. It could be reaching out to an estranged relative, you know, calling on the phone and going, hey, you know, we haven't talked in a while, and it's 2020 and COVID, and, and I really just thought that we should uh, clear the air between you can decide you're going to do that, um, and it might flop, but what um, remaining faithful looks like is you trust God with the results, uh, and, and you say, okay, I, I put myself out there, I did, you know, I, I, I made a choice, I put it into action, it was a loving choice, um, and I will trust that, that God will use that because that's all I have. Okay. That's all I can do today. Um, so uh, Oswald Chambers, he has a great devotional book. It's a little old timey in that it, it's written maybe in the 20s and, and it uses uh, some archaic language, but I love how deeply Oswald Chambers thinks and writes. And this is what he had to say about it. Fill your mind with the thought that God is there. And once your mind is truly filled with that thought, when you experience difficulties, it will be as easy as breathing for you to remember. My Heavenly Father knows all about this. Jesus said there are times when God cannot lift the darkness from you, but you should trust him. At times, God will appear like an unkind friend, but he is not. He will appear like an unjust judge, but he is not. Keep the thought that the mind of God is behind all things strong and growing. Therefore, you can rest in perfect confidence in God. God does not give us an overcoming life. He gives us life as we overcome. The strain of life is what builds our strength. If there is no strain, there will be no strength. My son tells me that all the time. He's got sore muscles. And I go, dude, do you want an Advil? He goes, no, that will I'll cancel my gains. <laughs> and he means that his understanding of the molecular level of muscle growth is first you strain the muscle, and then as the muscle heals without the Advil, <laughs> then the muscle gets stronger. And so here's Oswald Chambers saying, um, if there is no strain, there will be no strength. Um, so I, I lift that up to you. I invite you to consider it. I'm on page three now where we have James 1, and that's kind of our focal verse for the day. And you know how you can tell what our focal verse for the day is. It's been, I put it in like 17 translations for you. Um, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So here's, this is part of those equations that are all about perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded, which is about the worst thing you can be called in the Bible, double-minded. Uh, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And so we're just going to focus in on uh, verse 3, um, where the relationship between faith and hope and perseverance, and there's various translations there, knowing that the proving of your faith works patience. Because you have the knowledge that the testing of your faith gives you the power of going on in hope. 
You see how all these little cousins are woven together. Each has their own distinct DNA, but they have the DNA of their ancestors, and that's why they're cousins. Um, for you know that the testing of your trust produces perseverance. So we're, we're talking about, you know, like a chemical equation. You put these ingredients in and something comes out the other end. Um, and then uh, knowing that the testing or proving of your faith produces patience. Again, we see patience and perseverance kind of being uh, bandied about as uh, synonyms. Um, I encourage you to reflect on these translations and see if you have a favorite translation um, of this particular verse. Um, I personally like um, the testing of your faith produces perseverance, the way it is in the, the first one that I quoted there. Um, and I encourage you to spend some time, how would you describe the relationship between faith and perseverance? And, um, and then, so if that's faith and perseverance, and then describe your understanding of faith and hope that we did last week and perseverance. Maybe you draw circles, maybe it's a math equation, uh, I don't know, but maybe you use words in a sentence. Um, but and that's what I want you to think about and sort of your homework. So what we need is to see the track on the journey set before us. So we, we've talked about faith, and now we're, we're shifting to sort of a literal mindset of what is the track of this journey? And how do we know that's the track? And um, so Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, as we want our race, we're to keep our eye on Jesus. So, um, and I put a little start and finish line there. What did Paul mean when he said he had kept the faith? He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But what does our race track, our path, our course or terrain look like? And down at the bottom, it might even be a bigger print than the rest of it on page four. The track is a life of dependent faith in the living Christ. So you see how we're taking kind of Hebrews um, and we're running the race, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, but we want to know what our track is. And faith is going to help us answer what the track is because the track is the life of dependent faith. There could be other paths and other tracks, but what we're entertaining today is that our track is a life of dependent faith. And then we have to ask, because the scripture tells us to fix your eyes on Jesus and that our track is a life of dependent faith, what in the heck does that mean? Well, John 15 um, is the, the grapes and the vines, and, and he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So when he says it, he means it. The same word which tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing, also says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So again, the biblical word is part of staying on track for the life of dependent faith. And the key words are in that passage are through Jesus. So fixing your eyes on Jesus is understanding that our accomplishments are through Jesus. It's the exact opposite of a life of self-improvement and self-development and self-control and all those other self words, self-reliance. Um, I can do everything through uh, him who gives me strength is living by faith. So I hope these concepts are coming together for you that our track is defined by living a life of faith. And to, to, to understand that, we realize that the, our track, we should be focused on the finish line of Jesus and we have to live uh, by faith on that track. We can worry about how much faith we have, and we can try to conjure up more when all we really need is a mustard seed, but miss the one who is the object of our faith. Don't do that. Don't be like, oh, I just need to be more faithful. I just need to be more faithful. And in all that willing yourself to be more faithful, you forget, I can do everything through, uh, through him who gives me strength. you got to keep your eye on Jesus. Um, and keep in mind, it, it's not about more faith or better faith. It's a mustard seed is enough. Um, so some point to the parallel between a baby's dependent relationship with its mother and our life of dependency on Christ. And because of its dependent life, a baby in the womb could say, for me to live is mom. You see how there's really no boundary for that baby between him or her. 
her and mom. Life is mom. That's the nature of the dependency. Um, in the same way we can say, for me to live is Christ. And I, I know that is a challenging standard. I don't think it's easy, but I think it's my job to introduce you to the level of commitment that Christian perseverance is asking of us. So, I'm now on page six. Um, the idea of faith intersects and influences perseverance in a few ways. So, um, if this were some sort of statistics class, we would want to know what the variables were, and whether they were causal or whether they were outside. You know, we, 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 our mind likes patterns and relationships. So, let endurance or perseverance complete its work so that you may complete and, and sound in all respects, not lacking in anything. What work is it that endurance is to complete? Trials often reveal our weakness, aspects of our personality that we need to refine. And so with faith, in God's abiding presence, and God's redemptive powers, and God's great love, uh, those trials become building blocks of our Christian personalities. Now, those trials could be meaningless, or they could become building blocks of our Christian personalities. And uh, the difference in that is faith. Um, Practicing faith in God, we become maybe more patient, more appreciative, more compassionate at those building blocks. So there is a causal production element there. The work that endurance must complete is the vital work of molding us as Christians. See, we might think that perseverance means we're the last man standing, or you know, our body doesn't fail us at the end of the marathon. But I can tell you with 100% accuracy, our bodies always fail us. So our endurance must mean something more than being the last man standing. And uh, our endurance is completing the work of molding us as Christian people. Um, and another way to say that is God wants us to be the best we can be. And God has taken the time to provide the scripture and the model of what the best looks like. And then God is going to help us do that work of being the best we can be. Um, now, I might kind of skip over these challenges, but because um, we're, we're running low on time. But I, I, in these bullet points, I invite you to think about how faith can help you with whatever you're struggling with. It can fortify you. Um, you can draw on your faith. You can focus on faith. Um, these are ways that we can um, put faith to work for us. Now on page 7. The Apostle Paul is a huge example of keeping his faith. And we can learn from that. Um, so as we understand what keeping the faith means, we will not be easily shaken by every wind or teaching introduced by the craftiness of men. Paul's faith was based on the knowledge of Jesus and Jesus' resurrection. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. The reality of the life of Jesus, the truth concerning the trials of Jesus, and Pontius in front of the governor, Pontius Pilate, his resurrection, bed, all that um, is, is what Paul uh, puts his objective uh, view of the world in. Because I know this is real. And that's keeping the faith. Um, Paul had faith that Jesus was able to deliver. And so I'm at the bottom of page 7 now. The point is, our faith has a purpose. And the challenge is to say, how can or does that faith define the track that we're on? Okay? Apostle Paul stated his faith that... Our hope in Christ extends beyond this life. Paul believed, as we are called to believe, that the scriptures are inspired by God and that we are able to make, they are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. I read that sentence to say, I don't get wise just because I read the scriptures. I get wise because I am endeavoring to be a person of faith. I approach it with the concept that God is real. And then I say, uh, Jesus Christ helps me see Scripture in a new light. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and 
is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And by complete, if we turn the page back, we understand that means to be molded as the best Christian person we can be. Um, so then I have a caution for you. Our faith ought to be built on the solid foundation of the inspiration of the Bible as God's word and the truth concerning Jesus his re and his resurrection, which forms the basis for our faith. And I know you think, she's repeating herself. How many times can she say this? But uh, I firmly believe if I had a, a whiteboard or a blackboard, um, I would write on it and then I would sing a song about it. And then, because the way that we learn it is through the repetition. And um, so scripture is important. Our approach to God, our beliefs about God before we even open the Bible, our faith is important. And it shouldn't be dependent on what um, some might call a feel-good factor that comes from being in a community of fellow believers. Do you know what I mean by the feel-good factor? You have it with the, the women's circles, you have it with a pastor that you adore, you have it with the people that you've sat behind and in front of in the pews for years. That's, that's Christian community. And it feels good. Those are good people. Um, but our concept of staying the course shouldn't be gauged by that feel-good factor. Neither should it be based on the ability to gain health and wealth in this life without the need to pray to God. You can pray to God every day and your prayers can be right and perfect and you can make all kinds of great health decisions and um, there's nothing lacking in your prayer life or your faith life and you're still going to die. Um, you're, people are still going to get cancer. People are still going to face uh, unbearable trials like the loss of a child um, and things that we think we cannot bear. And our job is to not give up on God or think that God has given up on us. And, and that is us practicing that faith that then allows us to endure the unbearable. Um, and that brings us to the final uh, page nine, which is your worksheet. Um, and, and I encourage you um, in your own time to think about uh, not just the descriptions that I've given, uh, but go into the Bible verses and and ask yourself, what picture is emerging of the role of faith in perseverance? You know, it might start with, it's important. It might continue to, uh, if we have any hope at all of persevering, we need to get our faith right. If we need to do the strain of the, the lifting and not take the Advil. Um, and so then I, I invite you to say things in your own way. Faith helps to find the course of our race. You might want to say that a different way. Faith reminds us to focus on the goal or the prize, um, and you may want to phrase that a particular. The Bible has its own ways of phrasing it. Some other way may make it click for you. Faith invites us to think beyond or transcend our present circumstances. Uh, I think all the writings of Paul point to that again and again. You know, he, and we have lots of songs that point to that again and again. We, we need to look beyond our present circumstances. Um, and then just some other observations of the role of faith and perseverance. Faith fuels, that's what we said at the beginning, there's a power there. Hope anchors it, faith fuels perseverance. Uh, keeping the faith keeps us on track. The faith that produces endurance is, I'm sorry, dependent on God. And I say I'm sorry because I know dependency is so against our 21st century nature. And dependency on God takes faith. So I hope I've given you a lot to think about and that as you um, go through the Bible on your own or chat with people at lunch about it, that you uh, really consider um, what a life of dependent, dependent faith looks like and how you might uh, adjust or tweak um, your sense of, of understanding and your behavior in the world. And uh, with that, we are to exit the room and make room for the next crowd, but I'm available to, thank you.
I'm available out in the hall to chat if you have questions or just want to discuss uh, all these thick theological concepts.